The Psalms are concerned with the entire range of the human condition, but especially it seems like with suffering. That has been largely in view, especially in this first section of the Psalter. This Psalm, Psalm 30, deals with sickness specifically and how God brings healing in times of sickness and suffering. And I'm sure this applies to so many people who are watching this, that maybe you're in a time of sickness and health issues or someone that you know and love is. It's almost guaranteed someone in your life is dealing with sickness. And so as we come to God with these prayers, this is just an encouragement, a great reminder of how we should view times of sickness and suffering. We've seen in this section of Psalms 23 to 30 that God's house, the temple, is in view over and over and over again. And so we've seen this, we saw this in the last Psalm, Psalm 29, where there's this focus on the voice voice of the Lord, but there's also this response from the temple that everyone from the temple is shouting glory. Like they're, they're, they're praising God from his temple. And then Psalm 30 is the last in this set of Psalms that has this focus on the temple. And it starts with the title, a song of dedicate or song at the dedication of the temple. So this word for temple in the Hebrew, it's actually really just the word house, which is the word bet or bet. So think of like the, the city of Bethlehem. That first part of that city is house and the second part is bread. So house of bread. Here he uses that same word for house and the translators you know, kind of inferred the idea of temple. But that word for house is a loaded word for David because in the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel chapter 7, which is one of the most important chapters of the Old Testament, God makes this covenant with David where he says, I'm going to put my uh, my king on your throne. Your kingdom will be where my throne is. Essentially, he's combining the human throne of David and Israel with his heavenly throne. And he says that one day there's going to come this son that well we can we can you know go into it in detail but essentially he's pointing to the future messiah right who will be punished with the rods of men so this is an incredible word for david and it starts off in that chapter where david is looking to build a house the temple for god and god responds to him by saying you want to build a house for me no david i'm going to build a house for you I don't need a house from you. You need a house from me. And and the house in that context is the dynasty of David. And so that word has all of those meanings of the dynasty of David, but also of the temple of God. So there's a question here as to which of those this means. It might have some of both meanings, but I would take it as being adequately and accurately understood as the temple. This is speaking to um, a psalm that he wrote probably in the in anticipation of the temple dedication because the temple wasn't built in David's time. So the outline for this passage is is pretty simple. The first five verses, we're going to see God's healing. He's going to speak first of how God has delivered him. And then he'll kind of go back. And in verses six to 10, we see David's sickness is in view. He reflects on this time when he was suffering and he was needy. And then the last two verses, 11 to 12, we'll see David's praise. So let's start first with Psalm 30, verses 1 through 5, God's healing. God's healing. Look at verse 1. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. This is interesting language at the beginning because he says he's going to extol God or kind of lift God up because God has drawn him up. So there's sort of a parallel here. The language that's used of being drawn up is the same language of a bucket being lifted out of a well. And here the idea that that verb is being used of being pulled out of disaster. God has drawn him out of a disastrous situation. So it's kind of cool because it's as if he's saying that God has lifted him up out of danger. And so he's going to lift God up in praise as a response. Verse two, he says, O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help and you have healed me. O Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. So the trouble that God rescued him from seems to have been some sort of a sickness. And even he was even in danger of going down to the grave. All right, so that word Sheol, as we've seen before, is this word that refers to the grave or to death. So he was in danger of going to Sheol because of his sickness, and God rescued him out of it. 
Now, we don't know, we have to be honest and say, we don't know for sure if this sickness here is meant to be referring to a literal sickness or if it's metaphorical of sin or of some sort of spiritual situation that he was in. But this passage certainly has application both ways. And so in this situation where God delivered him, it leads him and encourages him to praise God, to praise God and lift him up. Look at verse 4. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. That's beautiful, man. This is, this is such a beautiful passage, and of course, it's very famous as well. It's likely you've heard this quoted before, even if you're not familiar with, with the Bible. And the, the truth it's showing to us is one that we see throughout Scripture, that God, in his anger and his discipline of his people, is angry for a moment, but his favor and his grace extends forever. In other words, there are times of suffering. There are times when bad things happen or when God even disciplines his people because of their sins. But if you are one of God's people, if you're one of his redeemed, then this is a momentary and fleeting thing compared to his grace and favor. Uh, the, the discipline is there for a moment, but his favor rests on you forever. We see the same language in uh, places like Isaiah 54. Listen to Isaiah 54 verses 6 to 8. For the Lord has called you like a wife deserted and grieved in spirit, like a wife of youth when she is cast off, says your God. For a brief moment I deserted you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In overflowing anger for a moment I hid my face from you, but with everlasting love I will have compassion on you. So when he's speaking here of the metaphor of this bride who's been abandoned by her husband, the reason why he's saying this is because Israel has sinned and therefore God responded in judgment, in anger. But this is a temporary thing, he's saying. Uh, His people are still his, his bride is still his, and he will redeem them. And so what we see in this passage for us is that things may be difficult now, but that is a momentary thing, that is a brief thing compared to God's favor and his grace and his goodness that will be given to us for all of eternity. This is really a good picture of the power of resurrection working in our lives, that God can take something that's that's, uh, capable of only ever producing death, like sickness, and actually turn it around and make it into a source of life. He takes a bad situation and he makes it into something good. And what could be a greater encouragement for you in your sickness right now than the reality that your sickness and suffering is going to be used by God for his good purposes. That, that whatever you're dealing with right now, that it could be the worst pain, the worst suffering in your life, it's momentary if you know Jesus Christ, if you've been rescued by him. It's not going to last forever. The eternal reality is going to be everlasting goodness and blessing. So David starts off by praising God for this healing. And then we see in verses 6 to to 10, we see David reflecting back on his sickness. So Psalm 30, verses 6 to 10 is David's sickness. This is what he says, verses 6 and 7. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face. I was dismayed. So he's reflecting on his own sickness here and what led to that and how he had this time when he was overly confident. Uh, He looks back and he says, man, there was a time when I I was thinking, I'll never be moved. My life is secure. I'm good. I'm strong. I'm healthy. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, I think, uh, maybe not this specific verse, but I, I think about this reality so often when I get sick. Like when you get a really bad flu or you get injured or something, it's amazing how horrible you feel, right? You went from feeling so good to so horrible. And I'll think, man, all those, all the last several months or several years when I was healthy, I just took it for granted. I didn't even think about how blessed I am to be that healthy and that functional. And now I'm sitting here in bed and I feel awful, right? And so David's thinking the same thing and that there can be this arrogance and confidence when things are going well, when you're prosperous, that you just assume things will always be this way but it's not always the case. And often we can in turn in our prosperity, we can abandon God. We can reject God because we think we don't need him. Often our times of 
of abundance are the most dangerous times spiritually because we forget how dependent we are on God every single day. And we forget to turn and to thank him and to pray for his blessing in our lives. He says in verse seven, he says, by your favor, you made my mountain stand strong. I, I think this is metaphorically saying, right? So the mountain here is a metaphor for David's life. And it's what it's saying is the reason why David was secure and strong was because God had established him. It was because God was working in his life. It was God's doing, not his own strength, that had made him secure. And so David reflects on that, his own overconfidence in the fact that it was God who gave that to him. And God takes that away for a season by hiding his face or hiding his blessing from David. And this momentary darkness, this this hiding of God's face, reminded David of exactly how dependent he was on God. You know, think about the times where you've had true prosperity and maybe you've fallen into the same trap. Maybe you're there right now. You, you think you don't need God. You don't spend time with God. You don't come to him in dependence. Remember in your time of prosperity, if that's you right now, remember to depend on God, to trust God even and especially in the times where things are really good and where it's easy to think you don't need him. Learn this lesson from the Psalms now. Don't learn it simply through the discipline or through suffering from God. Look at verse 8. He says, To you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. So David, in response, cries out. And the the way he's reasoning here is he's looking to God's interests and saying, If I live, if I continue, this is how you will be blessed, God. This is how you will benefit. He's thinking about God's interests and not his own. And this is where we should focus very often in our prayers. Um, it's always good to you know, come to God to ask him for what we need, but it's also good to remember why God should supply that to us because we play a certain role in his plan. He's saying, really, will God benefit if David dies? Will he receive praise? Will he have someone to testify about God's character and his, and his works? So David understands that he should appeal to God, not because of what he needs, but because of what benefits God. It's an interesting thing that we often don't do. Uh, and if you've been saved by God, then these things are what you're here for. You don't exist for yourself. You exist for God. And this should be evident to you if you know Jesus. It's a good reminder. I love this because it's a good reminder of why we exist. These things right here are why we exist. Um, we, should, we should be asking for more life and for more blessing from God so that we can testify to him so that we can tell others, so that we can praise him and rejoice in him. Those are the offerings that we have to God, and that is why we are here on this earth. And then David ends with this final praise to God. He started with praise because of God's deliverance. Then he recounted his time of of sickness and suffering, and then he finishes with simply thanking God. So verses 11 to 12 are David's praise, David's praise. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness that my, my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. Oh, Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Look at the movement in these verses, that, that the change that happens. He goes from mourning to dancing, from wearing sackcloth, which is this you know, picture of, uh, of, of mourning. It's, you'd wear these rough clothes in times of mourning, so everyone would know that you were mourning. He goes from sackcloth to being clothed with gladness. He goes from being silent to singing God's praise. There's this reversal that happens here, and and this is the result of this redemption or resurrection that David experiences metaphorically here. It's, It's praise. It's that we would give thanks to God forever. This is the only right response. And David is demonstrating Throughout this passage, this movement from death to life, from sorrow to gladness. Um, that's, that's what this whole passage is about, right? That weeping may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. In the times of darkness, there's always a light breaking through. That's what this whole, this whole psalm is about. And that reality of moving from death to life, from sorrow to gladness, is, is shown nowhere more clearly than in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
this psalm reminds us of what happened to Jesus, who dies on a Friday and is resurrected on the first day of a new week to start something new, who is planted in a garden tomb and then who's resurrected as this picture of life that's going to be given to everyone who believes in him and to the creation itself. And when we get to the New Testament after Jesus, what we see is a strengthening of this theme, this theme that sorrow leads to or you know always breaks through in gladness and in joy. What we actually see is in the New Testament is that temporary sorrow produces eternal joy. There's actually a it's actually involved in in preparing or producing something for us that lasts forever. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, 17. This is where the Apostle Paul speaks. He says, For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So he doesn't say just that this, this affliction is light and momentary or just that it is going to be replaced by glory he says it's actually preparing for us eternal glory. So this is what we suffer now is shaping us, it's changing us, and it's preparing for us something so much better, something that can never be taken away from us. This, God's anger may be for a moment, but his favor is for a lifetime. It's for eternity even. John 16, <clears throat> verse 20, Jesus sp- speaks to the same reality. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, you will le- weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. And then he goes on in verse 22, he says, so also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. I love it. So the sorrow we have now is not just preparing joy, it's going to be transformed into joy. All the things that weighed us down are going to become reasons to celebrate and to give praise to God. So I love this psalm of healing, and let's remember this truth, that the resurrection of Jesus Christ guarantees to us this reality, that whatever suffering we have now, whatever sickness we have now, will one day break through in eternal glory and blessing. Thanks so much for watching this video. We're uploading great biblical content every single week, so make sure you subscribe, like this video, and leave a comment down below. We'd love to discuss with you. If you wanna support us financially, there's a link in the description of this video. Thanks so much.